not in three persons, blessed Trinity. Well, welcome to week six in our Sports in the Bible series. And today we are talking about hockey and more specifically uh, about the hat trick when a player scores three goals in one game. Now, no one knows for sure when that started to be called a hat trick in hockey. One uh, source says that it began when a Toronto haberdasher began to give hats to those on the Maple Leaf team that scored three goals in a game. Another source says that uh, it started with an Ontario minor league team called the Mad Hatters that gave fedoras to, uh, to their players when they scored uh, three goals in a game. And, and still others say that it started with a Chicago Blackhawk player who didn't ha have enough money to buy a hat at, at the store, and the store owner said that, that if he scored three goals that night, he would give him the hat for free, and he scored four, and he got his hat. So that's a hat trick in hockey. It is three goals in one game. It's a very simple concept to understand. In Christianity, we have our own version of a hat trick, but it's not quite so simple. It's called the Trinity, God in three persons. Three persons, one God, the Trinity. Now, the Bible never uses the word Trinity, although it is found all over the Bible. But we give it that name, the Trinity, to describe how the God is so complex, more complex than we can understand like we find in the first chapter of, of John. Here he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then a little later, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word was with God. If you're with somebody, that means that there's, there's more than one of you. But the word was God. Well, that, that's just one, that's the same. And the word became flesh, the only son of the father. Okay, that, that's separate. But through him all things were made. Well, that's the creator that we normally associate with God the father. So it's a tough thing to wrap our minds around. I mean, is there one God? Yes, is there the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all three of them are God? Yes. It's a complex mystery. But why shouldn't God be complex? I mean, I'm always amazed that people will reject the God of the Bible because they can't completely understand God, as if God could only be as big as we can, can wrap our minds around. People say things like, well, I don't believe in God because how can, how can there be someone who is everywhere at the same time and, and who can hear all of our prayers? I don't believe it. Or they'll say, well, if there was a God, then people wouldn't get cancer or there, or there wouldn't be hurricanes. I don't understand why God just doesn't make all things perfect if there really was a God. Or they'll say, well, no God would die on a cross if they really were all-powerful. It just doesn't make sense. Excuse me. <coughs> we insist that the creator of the universe be simpler to understand than the things that God created. Like math and the human body, they're so complex. Or, or like what your spouse really means when they say, it's fine. I mean, there are some things that are, 
They're unfathomable. And God is just that. And then when you tell folks that not only is there a God, but that God is the Trinity, three persons in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they say, well, that just can't possibly be true. Anything bigger than what we can wrap our heads around, we dismiss as nonsense. It's kind of like the story of the frog and the tadpoles. I don't know if you've heard that one before. There's a bunch of tadpoles in a pond, and one of them grows legs, as tadpoles do, and leaves the pond as a frog. And it is living out there in life beyond the pond, and then it hops back in the pond after a while, and all the other tadpoles uh, are so excited to hear about what it's like outside the pond. And so they ask questions. Is it easy to swim there? And the frog says, no, you don't swim, you hop. And he says, well, are there lots of fish there too? And the frog says, no, there are no fish, but there are things like rabbits and hawks and squirrels, things that have fur and wings and claws. And they say, well, is there lots of good algae to eat on the bottom? And the frog says, no, we eat flies that we catch in the air. And they say, what's air? And the more that the tadpoles ask questions and the more the frog talks, the more the tadpoles think it can't possibly be true, the frog must be making it all up. And for us to understand the triune God is as difficult as the tadpoles to understand life as a frog. Now fortunately, God came to us in Jesus. The word that was with God and the word that was God took on flesh and dwelt among us. And in Jesus we catch a glimpse of God in a way that we can understand. If we go a little bit further into John to the 14th chapter, here we find Jesus trying to, to help his disciples to understand Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. If you've seen Jesus, if you've listened to Jesus, if you've known Jesus, you know God. It's a simple truth, but it still doesn't really explain everything, does it? It's still a mystery. Almost 300 years after Jesus uttered those words, or actually about 300 years, Jesus had been gone for three centuries, at least uh, in a way that we could see him in the flesh. It became finally legal in the Roman Empire to be a Christian. And the Emperor Constantine had become a Christian after he had a, a religious experience but he didn't really know all the details of the Bible or, or of Christian theology and you know that's the way for most of us I think we become a Christian without having understood everything that's in here that's why we keep learning and we don't necessarily get an advanced theology degree before we decide to be a Christian we're like Constantine we, we have an experience of Christ and we come to faith in Christ, but there's a lot of things we don't know. So Constantine began to dive deeper to learn more. And when he did, he found it very confusing. And he also found that the leaders of the church weren't, didn't even seem to be on the same page. And so in the year 325, he brought together the Christian leaders from across the world to a Turkish city called Nicaea. It became what they call the first 
great council of the church, the first ecumenical council. And there, all summer long, that council worked to develop an, a statement of faith, a creed that would summarize primarily the Trinity. This weird mystery of if you've seen Jesus, or the Holy Spirit for that matter, you've seen God. Now, various churches had been using creeds or summaries of the faith prior to this. Uh, the Roman church used uh, what became the, the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed that we just read does talk about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't explain it. And the Council of Nicaea tried to explain it. And what they come up with, came up with is what we call today the Nicene Creed. You may have, uh, have joined in a service that used the creed. We believe in one God. Okay, there we go. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. But of course, what we just heard from John chapter 1 is that Jesus was also a part of that making of all the seen and unseen. All right. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, of one substance, uh, homoousis, as the Greek would, is there, the one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. And then we believe in one holy Catholic, which means universal, an apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So some of the things that are in the Apostles' Creed are in there. But then there's all that explanation. Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, of one substance, homoousis. So, now that you've uh, looked at the Nicene Creed, you completely understand the Trinity, right? Yeah, right. The church across the world confesses the triune nature of God, but it's still a mystery. It's kind of like love. We all know what love is. We've all experienced love, but when you try to put it into a few words and, and to write out a definition, well, even whole books come up short. You just can't do it. Back in, oh, around 1970, there was a woman who began to write little love notes to her future husband, her name was uh, Kim, and she wrote to Roberto, and she would s start it with, love is when, and then she would fill in uh, the end of that sentence in different ways, and she'd write a little cartoon with it. Um, love is when he messes up your marvelous hairdo, and you don't mind, things like that. Well, he saved those, uh, those up, and then they began to, to publish that. Uh, in little books, and it, and it really took off. And you may remember those who were around at that time, the Love Is uh, cartoons. Um, I don't know why, but she, she always drew them without clothes. I mean, you, they were just kind of like little round blobs, but uh, uh, it was in those books. And they appeared not only in books, but it became a syndicated cartoon. And it was on mugs and, and in greeting cards. Love Is. Love is when you're able to, being able to say you're sorry. Love is seeing, him, seeing in him what others can't see. 
Love is someone to share your dreams with. And unfortunately, that marvelous love story came to an end rather quickly because Roberto got cancer, and five years uh, later, um, he was terminal. And so she quit writing those Love Is uh, comics in order to spend time with him. So you could say that uh, love is being there when someone needs you. But they didn't disappear because she found another uh, cartoonist, Bill Asprey, to take over, which she has done since 1975. And to this day, they continue to, to publish the Love Is uh, cartoons, thousands and thousands of them. And I don't think you'll run out of things to say either because really you can't put into a few words what love is. The Bible says in 1 John 4 that God is love. It's the very nature of God, the very essence, the very being of God is love. And since the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit share the same essence, the same being, homoousis. We can say Jesus is love. The Holy Spirit is love. The Father is love, and it's all true. In fact, it's the triune nature of God that allows for God to truly love in the deepest sense. Because to truly love, there needs to be someone to love and to be loved by. And in the Trinity, we see this. In God... Within the Godhead, there is love and being loved. Still, it's unexplainable. To put into words exactly the totality of God and what it all means for there to be one God in three persons is beyond us to explain. And maybe that's why the Bible doesn't try to do it. In fact, the Bible is much less likely to explain the Trinity than it is to simply praise and to celebrate a God who is so big and so wonderful that we can encounter God in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's conclude today by just looking at, at one of those kinds of phrases. Paul's going along in, in Romans and he's laying out his theology and he's uh, sharing about salvation. And then at the end of the 11th chapter, he just stops and bursts out in a doxology, in praise. And he says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. We can't explain it. Not really. One God, three persons, the blessed trinity but we can't experience that God and we can know the love of that God and we can praise that God. So let's pray. God, you are so amazing, so beyond our understanding and yet you came to us in Jesus so that we might know of you in a way we could understand. You have moved in our hearts and lives through the Holy Spirit so we could experience your presence even when we couldn't see you. And yet putting it all together, it's beyond our comprehension. So Lord, we simply praise you. We praise you today for being such a great and marvelous and wonderful God and yet caring for us and being with us. Thank you for your presence here today. Carry us forth this week as we go.
go in your name.